I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I had no discernible Christian influence on my life until my late teens, apart from my mother's family. My mother was a Roman Catholic, uh, non-practicing because she had married outside the faith. But my mother's family were devout Roman Catholics. Um, they always struck me as nice people. My father's side of the family were more uh, rumbustious and uh, colourful, uh, which covers a multitude of sins. But my mother's family, they were very poor, but they were very nice. And I have that abiding memory. I, I don't know, I wouldn't have known to categorise them as Christians or not Christians. I didn't work within those uh, thought forms at that time. My first encounter with living Christianity was a boy at school. I was almost 17. He was the year ahead of me. We were very different. Uh, I was in the academic stream. He wasn't. Uh, I was really into sport. I played all kinds of sports at school. Uh, he wasn't. Uh, I was into girls. He wasn't too bothered. He, he played in a gospel band. We were very different, but there was something about his life that I suppose, I wouldn't have used this word then, I don't think, but I would use it now, intrigued me. I remember lying in my bed thinking, is this all that life is? I worked at school Monday to Friday, uh, Saturdays and Sunday nights, I, I, I played football on Saturday, Saturday nights and Sunday nights. I was clubbing, is what you, the word you call it today, uh, going to dances and discos, um, which I quite enjoyed, you know. But then I would come home and it would be so anticlimactic. And I remember thinking, is this what life is? And I bumped into this boy uh, late one Saturday night in the centre of Glasgow. He had been at a gospel meeting, I think. I'd been out in the town with a friend and we got chatting. And he said, would you like to come to the Bible class I go to tomorrow afternoon? And I liked Albert. You know, we, 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 we didn't know each other well, but we had become somewhat friendly. And I, whether to my surprise, I can't remember, I said, well, OK, because I lived a long way away from the school that I attended. In God's providence, I was brought up in the east end of Glasgow, a very rough part. I'd done quite well at primary school. My parents couldn't afford to send me to a private school, but my primary school teacher said, if you study Scots Gaelic, I can get you to a better school. So I traveled right across the city to get to school. So the Lord was taking me out of the culture that I was in, which was increasingly becoming a gang culture, not in a violent way, but I was taken out of that. So I came to this Bible class on a wet Sunday afternoon in November 1966. And I remember there was about 30 young people, late teens, early 20s. And I remember looking around thinking, are there any good looking girls here? That was my first thought. And I saw a girl that I recognised. I knew her, didn't know her well. She was in my year at school. And I thought, what is she doing here? Her name was Morag. The man who was leading the meeting, I subsequently learned, was told there are two unconverted boys here today. So he scrapped his talk and he just preached on John 3.16. I'd never heard John 3.16. I didn't know John 3.16. Uh, I didn't possess a Bible. I'm pretty sure there wasn't a Bible in my house. I'd never read the Bible. And I remember sitting bewildered, and that wouldn't be too strong, bewildered, puzzled, thinking, why would God love me? That didn't make sense to me because I didn't love him. I didn't question that God is. That never crossed my mind. I didn't sit thinking, ah, but is there really a God? That just didn't cross my mind. And I remember thinking, God loves me. Why would God love me? And then he said, uh, and he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to 
die on the cross, very simply um, taking the punishment. And I was sitting thinking, why would God do that? Why would God's son suffer that for me? I had no background. I, I have nothing to gauge this against. I just felt overwhelmed by what I was hearing. And I didn't know what to do. I, I, I was trying to fight back tears. You know, when you're almost 17, you don't show tears with young girls around. And he finished and I sat there and my mother had always taught me to be polite. <laughs> so I went up to the fellow and I said, um, I'd just like to thank you for your message. And he could see that I was really a little distressed. And he said, well, would you like to come back and we can talk more? And I said, yes. And he very simply went over the gospel. Um, I don't think I'd ever heard the word gospel. Well, that's not true because the fellow through whose influence I came to the Bible class, he later told me he was always talking to me about Jesus, but I don't remember anything he said. I just remember the impact his life had on me. And I think the, the fellow who was speaking to me said, do you want to be a Christian? And I said, I do. And then he prayed and he said, now you pray. The only prayer I'd ever prayed was what my mother had taught me. Um, As I lay me down to sleep, I pray, pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That was all I'd ever heard. But I stumbled a prayer, I think. And I knew immediately I wasn't the boy I'd been when I came in. And I almost skipped home, not quite, through the wet streets of Glasgow, heading for two buses to get me back home. And I, I knew pretty well that my life was going to be very, very different. And so it turned out, so a wet November day in Glasgow in 1966, God had mercy on me and opened my eyes to see, my ears to hear, um, at the time I thought I had done it all and then later the more I read the Bible I discovered no, you did it all you did it all probably my sense of call to the ministry I sometimes wonder about this whether I'm imagining this or whether I'm I don't know, looking back and adding I think my call to the ministry probably began that day. I remember thinking, and I think it was on that day, but again, you know, the years pass. I want to tell people about Jesus. I was just about to start university, uh, which was unusual because where I was brought up, almost no one went to university. I was the very first person in my family as far back as Adam, <laughs> to, to, to go to university. And when I went, I, I increasingly realised the only thing I want to do in life is to tell people about Jesus Christ. Uh, by that time I was going to um, a very fine uh, Presbyterian Reformed Congregation in Glasgow. George Phillip was the minister. Someone had told me that on Saturday nights this Church of Scotland had a Bible study and prayer meeting. Now my Saturday nights had been spent clubbing. Uh, and I thought, Saturday night? Prayer meeting? I wonder what that's like. And he was going through the book of Jeremiah and I sat for 40 minutes exposition, really just gripped. And I just kept coming back. Started coming on Sundays, morning and evening. Um, loved it and there was this growing sense of a call to the ministry and I shared that with the minister and the elders and they said well we'll just wait and see we'll just wait and see and eventually I came to the end of my first degree at Strathclyde University in Glasgow in economic history did four years there and 
the, elder, uh, the minister and the elders said, we believe it's right that you should pursue theological studies. The call was confirmed by them. Now that, that was important to me, that I didn't just go half cock and think, right, that's what I'm going to be doing. I, I knew it, it would be right for the church to recognise this was a genuine call and I wasn't just living in fantasy land. Um, so I went to study theology at Edinburgh University, uh, one of the four divinity faculties in Scotland, uh, with the support and encouragement of my local church. And the desire to, to preach Christ and to be a pastor just continued to grow and grow. I had spells and bouts of self-doubt. I remember on one occasion sitting bolt upright in my bed thinking, Lord, this just terrifies me. Uh, but the Lord gives grace. Uh, finished my divinity studies at Edinburgh University, uh, became an assistant pastor in Aberdeen for a year. And then Edinburgh University, kindly or whatever, uh, offered me a three-year scholarship to go back and study theology. And I wasn't sure whether to do this or not, but I did. And uh, went back for three years and then finished a dissertation, uh, which was then subsequently, subsequently published. And then I was called to my first charge in New Mills, Ayrshire. I uh, was there for 20 years. Loved every minute, though the first nine and a half years were a huge battle. But the Lord was kind. In the middle of the 10th year, everything changed in the church. And then after 20 years, went to Cambridge and was pastor of Cambridge Presbyterian Church for 17 years. Loved every minute of that. And now today, uh, I teach historical theology at Edinburgh Theological Seminary and teach church history and um, reform spirituality at Greenville Presbyterian Seminary in South Carolina. During those years, it became increasingly clear to me that as the church drifted increasingly, especially in Scotland, from its gospel reformed heritage, that the, that the great reason, there are many reasons, of course, there's always multiple reasons, but for me, the great reason was we've become disconnected from who God is. We have lost the sight and the sense, not, not just the sight, not just the theological sight of the triune God, but the sense of God, his Godness, his holiness, his greatness, his majesty, his power, his grace. Um, we had... We had drifted from the truth that Jesus Christ himself is the gospel. The gospel isn't a package that God gives us because of Jesus. Jesus Christ is the gospel that God gives us. He is the good news. And speaking only for myself, but I hope for others too, I think the greatest need in the church today is for the church to be freshly acquainted with who God is, who the God of the Bible is, who the God of salvation is. You know, we, we, we talk about the Reformed faith and Calvinism. If you were to ask John Calvin, well, the question, you know, what is Calvinism? I could be almost certain he would say to you, Calvinism, no, he would hate the very thought, but he would say Calvinism is life lived for the glory of the triune God. And you say, well, what about tulip, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance for the saints? He would somewhat look at you and think, why are you extracting five bones from a body? There's another 202 bones in the body. Yeah, these five bones, yeah, they're important, they're, they're truths. But if you dislocate them from the whole, they become clinical, uh, even cold. 
And when you read Calvin, uh, you, you think, here is someone who is absorbed in the triune God. There's a great passage in Book 1 of the Institutes, um, Book 1, Chapter 13, Section 17, where Calvin quotes an early church Greek father called Gregory Nazianzen. And he says, these words of Gregory vastly delight me. Now, Calvin is never overexpressive. So if anything vastly delights Calvin, you stop and you think, right, what, what is it? And he quotes these words of Gregory, <coughs> which are taken from, if I remember rightly, his baptismal oration 40, section 41. And Gregory says, when I think of the one, I must think of the three. But when I think of the three, I must think of the one. They are one undivided torch. And the more I think, the more my mind is expanded and tears come to me and I have to leave off and worship. And I think, every time I read those words, I think, Ian, when were you last filled with wonder at pondering the triunity of God? For Calvin, that's, that's what the gospel is. It's about God the God who in Jesus Christ has come uh, to seek and to save the lost. Jesus Christ comes as the sent one of the Father. He's upheld by the Spirit. Uh, the, the Trinity is everywhere. And so the church, we, I, we need freshly acquainted, not just intellectually, but experientially, with who God is and I often think of Martin Lloyd-Jones's um, words, I can forgive a preacher almost anything if you'll give me big thoughts of God. And if I look at my own ministry, I, I think more than anything, probably, that's what disheartens me. I've not given people the big thoughts of God that God gives of himself in the Bible. It's so easy to come to God's word and look for yourself. Uh, you know, we need comfort, we need help, we need strength, we need wisdom, we need, we need, we need, and all that's true. But we're to come to God's word first and foremost, to behold our God. And it's, it's when that dawns on us, actually, everything else begins to slot into place. Not, not as if life becomes simple and sweet and easy, but so many of the things that trouble us and perplex us and at times almost overwhelm us are because God is not where he should be at the centre. So three words that capture the essence of God's revelation in Holy Scripture. Behold your God.